Brown, and this is Man versus Brown. So if I told you that there existed an institution that was well-funded and wanted to give you funding for your products and services, would you think that I was crazy if I told you that all you had to do was to follow the policies and procedures of that institution in order to gain money and there was enough available money that you weren't in a rat race of sort to try to get to that money. Would you think that I was making up a story? Well, I have Rick Howard of DOD Contract and he wants to talk about how you can work with the government in order to get your business in contract with that institution. Now, I know that uh, you guys are probably thinking, man, I don't know about the time it's gonna take, the paperwork that I'll have to file, uh, all of the litigious uh, work that has to be done for this contract to be uh, procured. And, 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 and I don't even necessarily know if I wanna work with the government. Maybe there's gonna be this oversight or maybe they're gonna be digging into my books a little, too uh, frequently or readily for me to even want this. I don't know. I mean, I think that some of it may be a bit of myth. Some of it may be uh, some hearsay. And some of it may be just really crappy branding on the side of what military contracts, what government contracts, what uh, regional, national, citywide contracts can look like and what that can mean for your bottom line. If you want to be more profitable, if you want to find yourself in spaces where there is a reliable stream of income coming into your business based on goods and services that you already provide and that there's a need for, then this might actually be the episode for you. So I'm going to let Rick tell you a little bit about what he does, and we're going to get into, dive into what it takes to procure a DOB contract with his organization, right, through his organization informed by his organization and hopefully you will walk away from this episode knowing a little bit more about how you can make a lot more money so i'm gonna pass it over to him rick what's going on buddy how are you say hello to the audience hey what's going on man how you doing today i'm good i'm good so so talk to me man dodcontract.com let's talk about what does that mean yeah so dodcontract.com that's the name of our website for uh, DOD Contract Academy. It's an online platform where we help small businesses win big government contracts. So training, coaching, you know, the whole shebang from starting to closing those first contracts. That's where we're helping. That's exciting. So how did you get into this space? Like what sort of drove you into this path? Yeah, so that's a good question. So I spent 20 years in the Air Force. Uh, you know, about half that time was flying uh, intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance aircraft. But eventually I transitioned into acquisitions and acquisitions is the profession of putting companies on contract for the U.S. government. And so what informed that choice? Like, did you just decide that you no longer wanted to fly? <laughs> uh, did you decide that, you know, was there an injury? Like what got you from the space of like, I'm flying aircraft, so like I'm going to support small businesses to gain contracts. What was that transition like? Yeah, no, that that's a good question. So uh, I was not a conscious choice to say, hey, I'm going to stop flying. I loved what I was doing. It was my dream job. Um, unfortunately, I was in uh, I was in Georgia uh, flying an aircraft called J Stars and. Uh, my wife and I uh, then moved to Alabama. We had two young children there. Uh, we we're going to the Air Command and Staff College. It's a one-year master's program. And towards the end of that year, and it, that, that is a great year typically for military officers. Um, and it was for us up until the very end. And, and, and at the very end, uh, you know, we had our assignment. We were going to Pensacola, Florida. It's, it's where we wanted to go. We had a leadership opportunity there. And uh, my youngest son, my one-year-old son, was diagnosed with a very rare form of cancer. And unfortunately, you know, obviously everything stopped for us, right? That just, you know, we just wanted to get him right. And we knew that 
uh, the hospitals in Boston were really good. And um, the hospitals in Alabama were actually telling us that Dana Faber, Boston Children's Hospital, that is where his rare form of cancer would be best treated. So uh, Air Force bent over backwards to bring us to Boston. And, you know, we went up there. He's doing great. He's been, uh, you know, in remission for a long time now. And yeah, no, it's amazing. And that's the most important thing, obviously. Um, but as a result of that, the uh, Air Force Base we were stationed at, Hanscom Air Force Base, that's not, there's no flying mission there. That's an acquisition space. So I was retrained or repurposed as a, a program manager, uh, which uh, the responsibility was basically to take uh, the government requirement, like, hey, we need this. We got to solve this problem and then find money. We, here's the funding and then find a company that could solve that problem set. Uh, put them on contract and, and manage that. So that's what I did for the remainder of my career in various forms. And um, yeah, it was really interesting. I got to see a lot of different companies, a lot of different uh, problems being solved. Awesome, man. Well, first, congrats on your son uh, being in remission and God bless that that journey that he has in front of him. Um, and I think that, you know, it's so interesting the way that life will align us to purposes that we didn't even know that we had, right? Or yeah. or to journeys, right, that are fulfilling in a different way, but that are equally fulfilling in the way that it provides this sense of, of urgency and passion and want to succeed. So thank you for making that transition, hence you being on the podcast today. Yeah. Uh, now, I think that there's maybe uh, – a thought, right, that like much of what the government wants are like weapons and or technology to to fund warfare and or like uh, surveillance, monitoring. Tell me really about the breadth of like the types of contracts that are being um, sought after by the government. Like what's the, what's the what's that what's those industries like? What are those services like? What are those products? So that is a, a great point to make and, and a great thing to talk about. And it was, it was also one of my major points of consternation as a you know, program manager in the Air Force, where I would notice that the businesses that I wanted to put on contract didn't even know the government was buying these types of things, right? Because you're right. A lot of you know, people think, oh, the government buys weapons, of course. They buy airplanes and F-22s, but they don't buy accounting services or landscaping services. You know, they're not going to pay us to paint a building or move furniture. But in fact, the government buys just about everything that you could think of. And, and actually, it would blow your mind if you saw some of the things they were actually spending your money on, including guitars and piano lessons and Tai Chi and, and a bunch of other stuff. But if you can, if you're selling it, odds are the government is buying it. Um, the question is, how much of it are they buying? Uh, but even the answer to that question is usually enough to make it worth your while. So a uh, good way to think of it is, you know, every military base is really like a small town or city, right? So and all the infrastructure that goes into that from the supermarket to the schools to the buildings that need to be maintained and up, uh, updated, the soccer fields need to be kept up, all the people working there, you know, vehicles, in some cases, an airport, police stations, hospital, I mean, everything that a normal city or town would have, you know, most military bases have something similar. And if you multiply that, not just in this country, but around the world, you, you start seeing why some of that spending that you might not have thought of as government uh, contracting is there. Yeah. 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 So when, when folks also maybe of uh, government contracts and, and uh, maybe at every level of government, right. Uh, you tend to think of them as being sort of um, really like time consuming, very difficult to sort of figure out, um, specifically maybe as a way of, of barring companies from gaining those contracts. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the process, like the, yeah. the, 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 in the way that, you know, that small businesses should look at how they approach the process uh, in, in trying to gain government contracts. Yeah, no, uh, that's a, a great uh, thing to bring up as well. And here's the first thing I would think about if I was a small business. And it's why I, one of the reasons I started our consulting business and DOD Contract Academy. First thing is 
the government, not only does the government buy from small businesses, they are required to buy from small businesses. So roughly 23% of all government purchases have to be from small businesses. And they usually exceed that. I want to say in 2022, it was 28% of contracts actually went to small businesses. Those numbers just recently came out. That's over $160 billion a year spent on small business contracts. Now, this is the part, if you're a small business owner, this is the part that should get your attention. Less than half of 1% of small businesses are trying to sell to the government, yet 28% of contracts last year went to small businesses. The single biggest purchaser of goods and services in the entire world, less than half of 1% of small businesses out there, and that number is decreasing year over year. So you've got fewer and fewer small businesses capitalizing on more and more of these contracts. Now, as far as the process is concerned, this is one of those things that can be interpreted as complicated, right? You mentioned there's some myths um, and then there's uh, there's some fact in, uh, mixed in with that. So I'm not going to tell you government contracting is easy, right? But you created an academy for it. So clearly that's, that's, that's right. There's something that's to right. learn about this, right? Exactly. Because there's a lot of requirements out there. There's a lot of noise, I guess you could say. But as a small business owner, what you need to do is learn how the government buys what you're selling. Right. And so that's just a little piece of federal contracting, but that's all you need to know. So we want to find out, and this is what we walk our students through. We teach you how to find the agencies that buy what you sell, how much they're spending each year. And that can tell you also how much you can expect to make. We can look at companies just like yours that are already doing it and we can kind of reverse engineer that process. So who buys what you sell, how much are they spending? And then how do you, what do you need to do as a small business owner? to win those contracts. And that is a very focused path. That becomes very clear when we do our homework ahead of time, do the research, and then start influencing and start winning contracts. So are there small businesses that in your time uh, in consulting and both working within the government to uh, acquire uh, or and help facilitate uh, small businesses um, to get uh, government contracts, do you find that that any small businesses sort of pivot a part of their business model to focus on government contracts? Like, is it something that you're doing as a supplement or is this maybe a viable sort of business model to help grow your business in a substantial way? Yeah. So I would say it's both. Right. So I've worked with clients that have exclusively focused on selling to the government. That's not typically what I recommend. If you're if you're new to this, what I'd recommend is, you know, that you have your commercial business up and running ahead of time and that you can now dedicate a little bit of time and resource to pursuing that federal pipeline. Right. And you could start off small and very focused. And then as you start winning contracts, you can increase your footprint. Um, I'll tell you, many small businesses become large businesses through government contracting. Um, you know, government contracting is not known for being fast, but they are known for being stable and lucrative. So what you're bringing in is uh, you're bringing funding in to offset economic fluctuation, right? Because typically those contracts aren't going to bounce up and down. If you have a three-year government contract and that's set, th that's money coming in year over year, right? Uh, barring, you know, collapse of the government or, or you know, something, something that you've done uh, to not fulfill that contract. But the other thing is... Uh, Increasing the valuation of your business. If you want to sell your company, these contracts do tend to be large. Uh, the funding, depending on the industry you're in, and you can grow your company to a large business if that's the goal. Certainly, there are other businesses out there that have a strong commercial pipeline, and then they have a public sector pipeline. And in some cases, that's you know not the major source of income for the business, but you can really play it either way. Absolutely. So, so let's talk about this. What's the criteria or some of the over the criteria overview for being determined to be a small business? Is it based in in revenue, uh, 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 set gross sales, uh, a number of employees? Like what's the metric by which the government decides that you are, in fact, a small business? So you're going to love this, uh, the answer to this question, like a lot of government people may tell you, the, the answer is it depends, right? Okay. So what do, determines whether or not you're a small business in the government's eyes is the industry that you are selling in. And when I say that, the government has something called a North American Industry Classification Code, 
or NAICS code. And there are hundreds, at least hundreds of them. And so a NAICS code is five-digit code that w one might represent accounting, one might represent construction services, one might represent software or uh, cybersecurity. Depending on your NAICS code, it's going to either be the number of employees that you have as a business, right? So in usually if, it, if that's the determining factor, it's if you have under 500 employees, then you're probably considered a small business by the government. The other way to do that is some NAICS codes are by revenue and that revenue model shifts, right? So if you're in software technology, it's probably somewhere in the 20 million plus, uh, you know, uh, gross revenue each year. If you're under that, you're going to be considered a small business. If it, you know, other industries, it might be 15 million or 10 million. So you really got to determine what your NAICS code is and then take a look at that. And then um, that will be the determining factor. Absolutely. So uh, I have some listeners, viewers that are from other countries. Mm -hmm. is, is the procurement of a U.S. government contract uh, restricted to... Uh, small businesses within the U.S., uh, or if you are living outside of the U.S., but you are a U.S. citizen, you can also get it, or possibly it's open to all based on some sense of a criteria. Yeah, so you, you do not have to be a U.S.-based business or a U.S.-owned company to sell to the government. However, there are going to be some contracts that absolutely do require that, right? So each contract's a little bit different, but you know, as a general rule, if you're doing anything or if you're the creator of software or technology and that's gonna end up in a classified environment or sensitive environment of any sort, there's probably going to be some restriction there. Uh, it may be that the company has to be US owned and that US citizens only are involved with the development of the solution, uh, but, you know, if you own a business that it does, you know, like translation services, you could be in the Middle East. In fact, I was out there, uh, you know, putting people on contract. We had companies that provided translator services and they certainly were not U.S. businesses. In fact, we probably wouldn't even have wanted that at the time. We wanted locals who understood the language. So, I mean, it just depends. There's lots of different opportunities out there uh, for both U.S. based businesses and other. Thank you for that. Thank you for that clarity. So... What, what, so the 1% versus the 23% or so, right? The 1% the of businesses, uh, small businesses are applying versus the 20 something person. I think 23 might be wrong, maybe it's 26, but there's a percentage in which the government is required um, to uh, hold contracts from, from small businesses. What, what do you think the difference is in why small businesses aren't applying? Do you think it's that there's a lack of awareness? Do you think that there's, um, that people feel prohibited through, due to the process? Um, maybe there is awareness, but lack of readily available information. Where, where, why do you think that the 1% is so low? Because we know that so many small businesses, um, you know, they, their first, you know, once they have a viable product, it's all about finding a consumer. And so if you have this, this readily available consumer to you, even if the process takes a little longer, that to me would feel like incentive to at least apply and, and go through the process uh, in order to get that government contract. So why do you think the, the percentage is so low, in your opinion? Yeah, so uh, you touched on a lot of it. I almost just answered yes. I think that, <laughs> I think that number one, it's awareness. Certainly, I didn't know until I was an acquisitions officer that all, you know, putting it all together, hey, here's a percentage that we are supposed to put on contract with small businesses. By the way, this is how many are actually, you know, coming in and trying to work with the government and there's a decline. So that's the first one that, hey, the government buys, not only buys what you're selling, but they buy a lot of it. And if you understand this process, you can go in and win those contracts. And the second part, absolutely. This is not B2B sales or B2C. This is a process that is foreign to most business owners and salespeople. Because look, you know, government contracting started, you know, when the Revolutionary War was taking place, essentially, we have we have uh, traffic going back and forth, uh, I say traffic, but really letters where George Washington is pissed at contractors or government officials that are, you know, it's taking too long, or they're not delivering what they're supposed to. So basically, what, what those com type of complaints, uh, you know, there's most people, by the way, selling to the government are honest, 
good companies providing a great solution. And so, by the way, are the acquisitions professionals putting them on contract. What we yeah. hear about often are you know, a bad actor that's trying to do something nefarious, just like in any industry, right? Some yeah. Someone's trying to do something illegal or wrong. But what the result of that is, is you have people in the government, congressmen, senators that don't particularly understand this process themselves, because this takes some time to, to get they start making regulations and they start trying to make policies, right? And so we have a couple hundred years of these policies and regulations that have stacked up to the point where in the 80s, we had over 60,000 pages of regulations that an acquisitions officer would have to sort through just to understand wow. how he or she could put you on contract. Now, it's a little bit better now, but when you, when you have that mess of regulation and policy, it can make things confusing really fast. And that's why we're a big fan of keep it simple, right? Understand what you need to understand. And that's going to be different for your business versus, you know, the landscaping company next door. You know, they're going to be selling to a different person that buys those type of services through a different means. So understand what you need. And that's what we're teaching at the Academy. Awesome. So I'm going to get two more possible myths or maybe some understanding. I, I pulled some entrepreneurs, some small business owners and asked them before I did this, uh, this uh, oh, God, spot, what, what they what their thoughts were right. So we I have two more for you, and then uh, I, I want to talk a bit about your journey some more. Uh, yeah. the next thing is, is is there there may be some sense that um that the that getting government contracts are about sort of um a small body of individuals within the government sort of feeding their friends and family members or, um, you know, doing this for favors. And so it's sort of like an, it's not equitable, right? Like, so me trying to apply for this, I'm probably not going to get it because someone already has a connection to someone in the government and they're going to get some preferential treatment. So why even try to, you know, put up my service when I'm going to get beat by someone who just has a great relationship with someone that already exists in government. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good one. Cause that is a combination of one thing we just talked about, which is you hear about the bad things that go on, right? Just like in, in a lot of industries, which is, you know, was there a general that, you know, ended up, he was involved with getting a defense contractor, a contract. Yes. And then they got punished for that. Right. And you hear about that. You could think it's corrupt. You can also, and I'm going to give you a real example here. I'm going to give you guys some gold here that we teach in the academy. And this is really also the biggest mistake companies make when they first start trying to sell to the government, right? And this is what, what happens. You go, Sam.gov, by the way, is where you register your business to sell to the government. It's a government website. It's not a great government website, but it's a government website. And it's also so where you find the out there. there. Maybe this is an opportunity for you. <laughs> Yeah. Hey, you never know if you, yeah, exactly. You can go in there and redo that uh, user interface for them. That would, that would help me out a lot. Um, it's also the repository for where most government contract opportunities are coming through. So meaning you're going to see something like a request for proposal on legal services on, you know, Hey, we need somebody to, you know, paint the fence or, you know, do the landscaping or we're looking for a certain software tool. So here's a real example that I've heard probably 3,000 times with people that have called and, you know, I've been on the phone doing consultations. Uh, you register to sell to the government. You see these RFPs come through. It's perfect. It's exactly what you sell. You write a proposal, which can take time. You submit and you don't win and rinse and repeat. You've done this three, four, five times. Now what the company is seeing is, well, I start seeing that not only am I not winning, but my competitor is winning. And not only is it my competitor, but it looks like this proposal was written for them. I've seen five or six of these now. I'm writing responses. They're winning and it looks like they're written. So the whole thing's rigged. And what I tell them is, okay, it's not rigged, but that proposal was written for them. And you know, they scratch their head. So here's why. And this is just all of those regulations that have been stacking up have made this a little bit different than you, made, uh, you might see commercially, right? So by the time the request for proposal comes out, you got to pitch your handcuffs on the government procurement officer's hands. So you're not allowed to, all the requirements are set, the funding set. You're not talking to the separate businesses individually because that can be seen as preferential treatment. So often you might hear of companies protesting a government contract. Sometimes it's because the government is actually talked to 
one of those businesses after the request for proposal went out. So they're very careful about not talking to anyone, giving them any additional information. But before that solicitation comes out, now you're in something called the market research phase. And so, and this is something that is very necessary. Picture me, for instance, coming, I had to switch from flying. I'm now an acquisitions officer. I'm learning how to put companies on contract. And one of the first problems they handed me was a huge cybersecurity problem, right? You remember Snowden and all of, all of those guys. Yeah. So one of the things I had to solve was it was a cybersecurity mess. And at the time, I knew nothing about cybersecurity, right? Yeah. And here's the thing. These, the, pro, the contracting officers and program managers, they're doing tons of contracts, right? They have tons of efforts. So there has to be a way for them to talk to the people that actually know how to solve those problems. That's yeah. the market research phase. So in the market research phase, this is where I might put something out called a sources sought, or we might have an acquisitions forecast. And this is where a company has a, a legal way to, and most companies don't even respond to these. They have a legal way to answer my questions. So I might, hey, what, how do I solve this cybersecurity challenge? And you answer those questions, but you can also request a meeting with me. You can suggest things in there. You're basically helping the government write that solicitation. And that is what the guy who thinks it's rigged, his yeah. it's not rigged, but his competitor was in there six months prior doing a hell of a lot more work, working with the government to help write that. And then just by virtue of that, you have a relationship with the government. You're helping write the solicitation. You are also probably privy to some information working with the teams, right? That, you know, not that anything nefarious went on, but if you're in there having meetings and you that are legal and in that market research phase, you're just going to be, your odds of success have just skyrocketed. Yeah, it's very similar to coming into a business as a consultant and then they retain your, your, your consulting company as like an agency of record for whatever that consulting service was. So sure. you come in, you're consulting for project management and now your agency is that go to project management company. So because you did the part to help support them to create the program, to create um, the request for proposal, to sort out what they needed to understand about this thing in order to articulate what they needed, now you become a viable source to provide that need if you, if you also provide that service. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's about in this phase. It's it's a lot of it is about building relationships, just like you're going to do in the regular sales process. And this is the place that you're going to do it. And not only that, you're also eliminating competition potentially. So let's say that you're a a woman owned small business, or a service disabled veteran owned small business, or a minority or eight A business. Now there are even uh, the further set aside contracts for these type of companies. So a woman owned small business can go in and answer all those cybersecurity questions, have a nice meeting with the procurement office and also say, Hey, look, we're also a woman owned small business. I recommend that you set this contract aside for woman owned small businesses. And if the contracting office does that, well, guess what? You just eliminated every other company from even being able to submit a proposal on there and be considered. So uh, there are some uh, strategies that you can put into place to make yourself a little bit more competitive. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. All right. So one last thing, and I think that this is probably true for, actually, I have two. I'm not going to even, Rick, I'm not going to even hold you. I actually I'm have here, two. I'm, I'm here for as long yeah. as you want, man. No, no, I have two. I have two. And this one, one of them is actually coming from me that I just thought of. So, um, is it in your opinion, this is not the point for me, but is it in your opinion that that also maybe what might prohibit small businesses from uh, from uh, trying to gain government contracts is that maybe the nature of small business might be to be um, hyper local, maybe outside of tech is to be hyper local. So Maybe, they, maybe they're looking at their town, their city, and getting a contract there and equating that to getting a government contract. Do you think that some people may feel like they're, they, they've gotten a government contract, but there may be a federal contract that they could also be working toward? So there might be some sort of confusion as to the levels in which you can gain a contract. Someone asked me that, like, hey, I have a contract with New York City. Does that actually count as a government contract? because I'm technically working with the government body of New York. 
Right. So that's, you know, another good point. There are different levels of government. So I help companies sell to federal agencies and all of federal contracting is basically governed by something called the federal acquisitions regulations, which you know, we've, we've talked to or alluded to throughout the, the podcast here. Now, state yeah. and local government, they are not governed by those regulations. They can it can look like federal contracting, but every state, every uh, town, every community is a little bit different. Right. So what I would say, though, is that if you have one local or state contracts, you know what I tell our clients is, look, we have something called a capability statement. That's a marketing document that you hand to the government. But we often put past performance on there. I am definitely telling them about my past performance that is not federal, but state and local, because that builds up the confidence of the procurement officer to put you on contract. So I would use it. It might not technically count as federal, but it is at least state or local government. And it is something that, again, you can use to influence and uh, try to build that confidence up. Awesome. All right, here's mine. So I feel like this is something that I even coach and consult on, which is um, timeliness of application and completion of application, right? A lot of folks, uh, small business folks I'm talking to you, will, will take the time to do an, an entire, uh, fill out the proposal, but get it in a day late. Or... Uh, maybe people are asking for financials and it asks for four year spend and you provide three, right? Like how much, how many, you know, how much of the population of small business owners that are applying do you think maybe not make it through to the process due to just not uh, meeting the requirements of uh, getting everything submitted on time and getting everything submitted completely? Certainly some of them. Yeah. My hope is that most of them, certainly if they've been through the academy, they're not going to do any of what you just said. But here's, here's the real answer to this. If you're a company and you're thinking about selling to the government, when we're talking about if it gets to the point where you're getting, you have a solicitation you're responding to, which by the way, there are sole source contracts as well, where there's no competition. We haven't talked about that. But if we are competing and we are putting in a proposal, it is crucial that you get it in on time because if it's not in on time, it's going in the wastebasket. And not only that, you know, a lot of these are highly competitive and the government has a team of people that are going to score your proposal. So let's take some very some basics. Let's say they tell you to write your proposal, 20 pages max, 12 point font, new Roman. And it's due on February 20th. Well, A, if you submit it on the 21st, they're not even going to look at it. It was submitted late, right? Because they'd be showing you preferential treatment if they didn't. If you write a 25 page proposal, they cut the last five pages out. They won't even read them. Same reason, right? Preferential treatment. If you have it in a different font, you have, or, or anything else, or you, or you don't, like you mentioned cost, there's usually a cost, a pretty significant cost or commercialization section. If it's not answering the parameters that they wanted in the proposal, you're gonna be scored down. So it is, that's how you win when you get to a competitive proposal it is absolutely essential that you hit all those. In fact, most companies build something called a compliance matrix, which is a spreadsheet that, you know, would probably put you to sleep just to make sure they hit all the details. Yeah, no, I, I think that, you know, you, I, I definitely see it not definitely not in the government contract space, but definitely in like the nonprofit space, right? When folks are, are looking for funding, you find that like oftentimes, you know, the difference in, uh, whether they would win that funding or not will come down to um, not only how well they articulated uh, what need was or what, what they provided in order to get the funding, but how complete that articulation was and how it met the guidelines and what was required from them. And to that point, to that point, um, when, when, when small business owners are looking at a government contract, right? Like, what's the what's the response window? Is that usually go governed by the the actual like RFP request for proposal? Like, they'll let you know when they'll get back to you. Is it something where like three years down the line, like a lottery, you'll just get a call and they'll be like, "Hey, what's up? Remember when you submit for the, <laughs> to to give us you know IT services?" Well, hey. 
we actually have the funding. Let's go. Right. Is there is there like sort of tight parameters in terms of response time and expectation around yes. that? Is that what officers typically do, like help to create uh, and talk a, 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 a small business of interest into what that response process will look like so they understand, um, you know, what what the timeline looks like or, you know, when they'll get a definitive answer on whether they've gotten the contract or not? Yeah, so one way to answer that question is to focus on the official process. The official process be meaning that, you know, a source of SOD came out and you answer that, and but the, even the source of SOD is gonna have its due on this date, if you're looking at something through sam.gov. And that's on, you know, for, I don't know, I have a guitar on the wall. So that the government wants to buy a hundred guitars, right? So uh, we'll, we'll go with that. So a hundred guitars. Hey, yes, I can do that. And it's due on, you know, February 20th, like we said. And then yeah. through that process, they'll probably tell you, Hey, we predict that this contract is going to come out around June or something. And so then around June, an RFP comes out and says, all right, now we want a proposal from you for the hundred guitars. And so you have to put that in there and there's going to be a due date. It's due July 30th. And it has to be in by July 30th. So in that example, you have a timeline that's dictated by the government. But government funding gets lost in one all the time. There's a fallout funds at the end of the fiscal year. Fiscal year ends at the end of September, which is coming up. So the government will often call a small business and say, hey, I've got the funds now. You know, hey, remember that 100 guitars I wanted to buy? Well, now I have the money. A lot of times yeah. with small businesses, you won't have that competition, especially if you have an innovative technology or something unique then or training or something like that. That may be something that the government just reaches out to you and says, hey, I'm looking to buy this. Or maybe you did submit a source of SOT or had a meeting and they say, you know what, we could really use your solution. I don't have the funding right now. This just happened to me recently with one of our clients that I sell for. And so, you know, with that agency, particular agency in the Department of Defense, when they have funding, they tell me, hey, I want to buy X number of this and, you know, we'll do it in three weeks. So again, it's a little bit, I know I'm a little all over the place there. There's an official process. And then, you know, once you have on, once you're on contract and have a relationship with the government, you'll find that, you know, when funding falls into their lap, they may reach out for, uh, you know, some additional service or product from you. Awesome. All right. So let's talk about you. So I see the guitar hanging on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Right. And uh, I was actually going to go into the guitar conversation. So I'm glad that you created a really great segue oh, nice. into it. Right? Yeah. So there's like a lot of maybe a lot of this is kind of debunking, right? Talking about misconceptions. So yeah. a lot of folks tend to think of, of military officers as or government folks as being sort of rigid in a way that you know, sort of doesn't allow them to have like a sense of humanity and like like things like guitar and like, you know, want things like I want to learn how to, you know, do pottery or something. And I right. think that, that goes into this broader conversation about about small businesses and contracts because everything doesn't necessarily have to have like a direct government application. Some of it could be about providing services to human beings, right? Like making people happier. So talk to me about guitar and how the guitar makes you happy. I see it there. So I want oh, yeah. to know a little bit more about it. What, 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 what's the significance of the guitar? Well, I, first of all, I love playing the guitar and, you know, I, I mean, if I, if I tilt my screen a little bit, you're going to have, you know, uh, probably quite a few, quite a few more over there and, you know, kind of ah, okay. But uh, I actually, you know, when I started flying, I, you know, picked up an acoustic guitar and uh, I just started playing it on all my deployments, you know, took it around the world with me several times. You know, it was right after 9-11 uh, that, you know, we started hitting those missions nonstop, it seemed like. And so I picked up a, a definite deep love for playing the instrument, you know, and it's, in a lot of cases, it was the only companion I had, you know, so... Yeah. Uh, love playing the guitar and you know we had a band like at Hanscom Air Force Base where we would play retirement ceremonies and we every fly every good flying squadron has a bar so you know we would fly uh, we would play on Friday nights and have a couple beers and just uh, yeah. really a good time but yes I really enjoy playing the guitar and I have them scattered throughout the uh, house nice so what do you think I'm actually I'm, I'm sort of in this very interesting space where like I've never been much of a music guy 
Yeah. Just never really been, or I never thought of myself as a music guy. As you can see, I'm more of an art guy. So I'm like, I have like, I'm a big sort of art person. Uh, same thing, if I swivel, it'd be like all my walls have it, right? Yeah, uh, like but recently, what'd you say? I said, I like that picture behind you. Thank you, man. Yeah, I have, uh, I have here, I can see if I can shift slightly. So I have like more of it here and then more than there like oh, yeah. i'm just art's like my thing right and so but i've come to love music uh at this point in my life very differently than i have at any other and i think it's because there is something that is so like um so tethering around the human experience uh that music provides right and it, it's it's so universal, but it's universal in a way that, like, um, people don't have to necessarily even have a deep appreciation for your form of music, right? For the particular form that you're playing. It could be blues. It could be uh, jazz. It could be hard rock, right? Like, but people will still find themselves sort of entertained and influenced and kind of finding themselves in the rhythm of it. So what do you think it is about the universality of music? Like why is music so universally loved and appreciated? And how do we so easily tap into it? Well, I mean, we're, we're going to take a, a, a big left turn here from government. Yeah. yeah I, like I think music is spiritual, right? I mean, and that's, that's the point. I think it, it speaks to your spirit. So it, it, yeah. you can see it even in a place that's supposed to be rigid, like the military, as soon as you get the music going, right, all of a sudden the barriers come down, everyone starts hanging out and laughing and, you know, maybe it's a, a beer or Pepsi or whatever your thing is. But uh, yeah, I mean, I think music uh, speaks to people. It also could drive people away. I mean, if you heard my guitar playing, it might, it might drive some people in the, uh, the other direction. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. Art's probably the same way, right? Yeah. No, I, and I think that like, um, and I, I spoke about this on a podcast, and I think that music might actually be a form that I'm going to equate to this. But I think that, like, art, what's appealing to me about art is that as soon as you change a brushstroke, it is no longer the piece that it was initially. Right. And a lot of sort of art forms are the same regardless of if you change it or not. And I think music's sort of like that, right? Like as soon as you start to change chords or as soon as you start to sing it differently, yeah, it's it's um, it's sourced by the same music or by the same song, but it becomes something different in and of itself. It's no longer the same thing. And so that's what I appreciate about art is that it is a moment in time where like a person looked at who they were, what their context was, context was their own life, their context was to like history, uh, what was going on in their personal life, what was going on in the world, and they create something. And as soon as you smudge it, it is no longer what it originally was because now you're an art, you have added to the art as opposed to just having purely what the artist wanted. And I think music is similar in that way is that you can take an, a, you can take a piece and change it. And now we have two different forms. It's not the same thing. It's now two very different pieces, even if it's just a particular chord or a particular change, that thing then affects now you're, you are an artist and you have the original intent of the, the person who created it. And I think there's something cool about that. Yeah, I agree. I think that, you know, you mentioned it's a moment in time and that's, that's something that, you know, if I'm playing the guitar, for instance, it, it's, it only exists while you're doing it and then it's gone. That's one interest if you're not recording it with music. Right. So I think yeah. it's, it's one way if you are somebody that, that can't live in the moment and you're always thinking about the next thing for me, playing the guitar is something that's very grounding and, and it helps you to just live in that moment while you're playing that song and then it's over, right? And or like you're saying, you know, there might be a song that's recorded, but if you hear the band play live, it becomes something different. And yeah. that happens for most, I would say, musicians. Is if you go to the live concert, something 
it could even be just something they say at the beginning of the song, right? Or it could be, you know, a guitar solo that they didn't uh, intend on playing or maybe a mistake and they start riffing off the mistake. So yeah, it's definitely a, a both, I think, art and music, interesting art forms that are definitely relevant to time and constantly changing. Yeah, I, I remember being younger. I, I'm not sure if it feels as prevalent today, but I remember like the jam bands, like the Dave Matthews, the mm. the um, the Great. like uh, Fish, the Grateful Dead, like all of those sort of mega bands. And I remember people would go crazy to buy the live album. Yeah. Like the live album was almost more was almost equal, if not more important, than the studio album. Like people wanted these kind of particular moments where like these riffs were happening and these changes were happening, right? And it 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 was like, and it wasn't the same. It wasn't to say like, oh well, I have the studio album, so it's equal to right, like this this sort of live version of it, right? That was recorded. People really wanted the live version. I didn't understand it because I just was, it just was, I was like, I don't, why are you guys so, why are you guys so interested in, in this live thing? They're just playing the same thing that they played in the studio, right? They're just doing it in right. front of a crowd, right? Until you actually experience it and you realize that, you know, it's, you're experiencing like, emotion and you know a, a lack of filter and, and to your point i think this kind of immediacy right this sort of like being in the moment of it and that 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 thing just feels alive and organic and speaks to the spirit yeah. um you were saying earlier man so yeah absolutely i i definitely i'm definitely appreciating more music art form oh well, that's awesome yeah it's also it's also not perfect you know that those live performances i mean the studio albums are, you know, who knows how many takes they're doing on a lot of those, right? And they're trying, they're, they're kind of searching for perfection there. But that that live performance that got recorded, it's it's not perfect. And it wasn't, you know, done a thousand times to try to achieve this, you know, non-achievable standard. And, and part of that is, I think, what makes it cool and, and interesting, you know? Awesome. All right. So this brings us into a perfect transition right. into, to the two questions that I ask everyone on the man versus Ryan podcast. And then I'm going to ask you to share uh, the DLD contract website, uh, how folks can get into the Academy, what that process looks like. But I have two questions for you. All right. The first is on any streaming platform, podcast or book, what's something that you recently uh, consumed that you thoroughly enjoyed? Oh, no, there's a lot because I'm addicted to podcasts and books and and all of that. But so business made simple, you know, because I'm I'm in business, probably like a lot of people yeah. listening to your uh, your podcast. And I think his name's Ronald Miller. So he has a good, he has a great business podcast, which cool. uh, which I really love. Um, there's also so just kind of pivoting to music. There's I'm going to butcher the name of this Tetragrammaton. I think it's Tetragrammaton, and it's a it's a podcast by Rick Rubin. And okay. where he, Rick Rubin's a producer, a music producer from like the eighties, nineties, even now, I mean, he's a thousand hits and he, he wrote a book uh, recently called the creative act, which I've also streamed, which is also excellent. It's kind of like the I Ching only for creativity. Um, but yeah, he's a great podcast. He interviews a lot of artists and musicians and things. So you might like that if you haven't heard it before. Awesome. Both will be in the show notes guys. So definitely scroll down and click on wherever you're seeing and or listening to this. The second question, Rick, is on, very similar, on a streaming platform, podcast, or book, what's something that you thoroughly enjoy that people may not readily think that you would, right? What's something, not really a guilty pleasure, but what's something that you thoroughly enjoy that you have enjoyed recently that people may not associate with you, but that very much speaks to who you are? Well, I have a guilty pleasure of listening to old school Metallica albums and teaching my kids, <laughs> my young kids, the lyrics to those. So driving around. So, you know, just blaring, blaring that metal sometimes on a, uh, on a road trip back from, you know, the beach yeah. guilty pleasure. And it probably will be until the day I'm, I'm no longer here. So. Yeah. And, and I imagine that it pro it's probably going to live on in your family, right? Like <laughs> it's a part of your kids thing. So at oh, some yeah. point that's going to come up for their kids. That's awesome. My daughter's got a Metallica shirt, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. All right, so talk to me, 
Talk to the audience. Let us know, man. We want to get into this academy. How do we go about it? Yeah, so thank you for bringing this up. So we do have the DOD Contract Academy. So if you're thinking yeah. about selling to the government or you just want to learn about it, you can go to dodcontract.com. And it's a monthly membership. You can sign up. So we have online training. So that's on demand. And you can, it'll take you through the steps and show you all of the websites and the training tools and then the tactics and strategy we use to claim those contracts for you at the end, give you that edge. But also we have weekly coaching and you're by and large, you're going to get me or you're going to get another acquisitions professional. It's usually me. And we have our other Academy students in there. That's where we look at your specific business because each one's a little bit different and we can answer your questions and you're not breaking the bank. You're not paying, you know, $400,000 for some high end uh, consulting firm to come in and come in one with other small businesses. Um, the other resource that you have, which is completely free, is the DOD Contract Academy podcast. And that can be streamed on any platform, uh, you know, iTunes, Spotify, whatever you like to listen it to. Awesome. Um, so if I'm if I'm interested in in the academy, right? Like, and this is something I want to do, what how long should I expect to join? Like, is it is this something where like Every month, I'm going to get more information. The coach is going to be better. The my ability to 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 work uh, and get contracts uh, could be like diversified. Or is it something where like I'm looking at maybe doing this for four months or six months? Like what what's what's the what's the grad what's graduation look like for me? Right? Like yeah. what, is it something I'm doing continuously, or am I looking at a window of time that I'm going to participate? Yeah, so you could, if, if you just want to go in and learn everything that we have to tell you, uh, you yeah, could go yeah. in there for a month and just consume everything, right? And there's a lot of information in there, but you could consume everything and then technically just peace out after that. You, you've got your information. Most of our students stay for the long term. And I think really the benefit, we do teach a lot of strategy and tactics, I think clearly step by step that you're not going to get anywhere else in the training. But really those weekly coaching sessions I mean, to talk to somebody that has been involved with government acquisitions. I mean, typically people like me are working with big defense companies and they're charging those type of rates. This is a way where you can be coached each week. And when you're selling to the government, your problems are, are in, your problems and challenges are going to be changing, right? So from registering and getting certified to, hey, I've, how do I find my first opportunity to how do I influence this opportunity? What, hey, is there a niche I can pivot into that's more profitable? Do you have any recommended strategies for writing a proposal to, hey, I set up a meeting with the government. How do I structure the meeting? What question should I ask? There's always something, uh, a good example. Hey, I just, I want a contract with the government for uh, moving. Uh, this is a woman owned small business and her, she flew from Hawaii to Pensacola to do the site survey, hired everyone, showed up the first day and the government canceled her contract. Like, oh, I'm out, right? That usually doesn't happen, but the government canceled it, but because she was with us, no, you're not out. We'll write you the letter to the contracting officer. See, the government assumes you know things that you probably don't know. And so even if the government cancels a contract, they're still going to pay you for all of the effort you put in. So she ended up getting 80, 90% of her contract, even though she didn't have to actually execute that any of the moving or anything. So uh, those are the type of things and just an example of different problems that get solved uh, during our coaching sessions. Awesome. I think that sounds like that's not only just a great deal, but just a great way to approach um, understanding how to get government contracts, but also building great relationships to see how your business can grow and scale and, 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 and maybe the, the, your general interests for uh, wanting to secure a government contract, maybe that thing pivots or evolves into another service as your business grows or another product as your business grows. So as you're growing, staying in relationship with coaching that allow you to access those future opportunities is significantly important. Yeah, you can, you can a Coursera it, right? You can always just go watch videos and sort of do it on your own. But in a, in a world where relationships run everything, that's important. It is. Man, Rick, thank you so much for spending your time on the Man vs. Brand podcast sharing with us all of your knowledge around gaining government contracts, but also telling us a little bit about your own story, about how you entered this space and why you're passionate about it. I cannot wait to go on my 
next uh, trip. I'm definitely going to sit in the back and I'm going to blast some music. It may be Metallica, it may not. Not sure yet. <laughs> but I'm definitely going to do that because I feel like that's a really great way to enjoy the close of the summer. If you guys appreciate everything that Rick had to say, definitely go right now. Check out dodcontracts.com and make sure that you follow his podcast so that you can learn more about what he's talking about over there and how you can start to form relationships with the government so that you can grow your business, not just grow your business, do something vital for the country while you pursue your own small business goals. Thank you so much for, for being on the podcast. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate you all. Love you. Talk to you soon. Bye. Done. Good stuff, man.